Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, I'm going to talk about some home winemaking disasters. These are the kinds of things that cost you a lot of money. Many of them have happened to me or they've happened to some of my close friends, so stay tuned. If you need to see more Home Winemaking Channel videos, you might find them on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash makewine. Sometimes it just makes more sense to post over there. As a small YouTube creator, it doesn't make hardly any financial sense anymore to make videos on YouTube. So for a couple dollars, you can watch a few things there. Might even save you some money by saving a, uh, a big mistake. I've also got a handful of my stainless steel mixer degassers that not enough to really sell on my website, but I'll give them away on my Patreon page in the coming months. So stay tuned for that. Now let's talk about some big time disasters that have happened to me and I'd love to hear about yours because there's probably a lot that hasn't happened to me but I don't want it to happen in the future. One thing that happens to a lot of people is you get these big beautiful six gallon glass carboys and for the most part they're pretty durable but they're not indestructible. One time I set up one of my carboys to dry. This is a long time ago before I had my carboy dryers where it's kind of a intentionally made to prop them up. Well, I kind of propped it up on a wooden crate thinking that would be good. And for the most part it was until about two in the morning when I'm sound asleep and I just hear glass shattering everywhere. And you wake up to glass shattering, you're thinking somebody's in my house. So I'm <laughs> walking around my house like ready to go here when it turned out I shattered a carboy and man was I frustrated because I had already been about one carboy short. Well, now I was two carboys short. So if you're gonna set your carboys up to dry, make a little wooden prop kind of thing that's much better. I've got one, if you go way back in my videos, I've got some little homemade winemaking equipment videos. You'll find some pretty, pretty sturdy carboy props. Another way people break carboys is they get those clamp on handles. So you pick up, this is even worse by the way, because now you're breaking a carboy full of wine. So you pick it up and you yank the top off and shatter your carboy. To be honest, I've never had this happen. Some people swear that it can happen, but just be careful when you're using those kind of lifter handles, make sure you support it well. I like to use a milk crate to pick up a full carboy. It seems to be a little bit safer. It's got that plastic bottom so you're not banging it on things like a concrete floor. Which brings me to my third way that I've actually seen this a lot lately. Not personally, but I've seen a lot of people having this happen. Where some of these new carboys, it's almost like they're not heat treated or tempered quite right. Um, so there's a lot of internal stresses in the glass. And people will set their carboy on a hard floor, even sometimes a wood floor, and it'll blow the bottom out of their carboy and just make a massive, massive mess. And it's, I mean, even worse is you're losing all this wine. You could have aged it for two years and finally, boom, all your, all your hard work and patience is gone. So I like to use little um, pieces of like that luxury vinyl flooring. If I'm on concrete, I'll put a couple squares of that down, set carboys on that. And I've never had that problem. And just buy quality glass. It's not really worth saving a few bucks to buy, you know, the, the cheapest carboy that there is. The next thing that can happen, and this, I would bet if you've been making wine for more than about five years, this has happened to you. And that is the notorious wine volcano. So when wine's fermenting, a lot of times I'll ferment a white wine in um, a carboy. Uh, a lot of people ferment things like kits in carboys. Well, it's pretty similar to like a carbonated soda. And if you do something to agitate it, it could literally volcano. Like you've seen when people put like a Mentos in, in like a, a Coke or Pepsi, literally will do that. And what seems to be happening is if you add like a powdered additive, maybe it's tannin, um, maybe it's a, you know, tartaric acid or potassium bicarbonate, it really, creates like a nucleating site for the all these little bubbles and they just go bonkers and boom. Um, so I always like to mix my additives in either a little bit of wine or a little bit of water and really, really like make sure there's no dry powder. And I'm always gonna add 
really slow. And if I'm gonna mix it up, I'm also gonna mix it up slow because use maybe my punch or my little mixing tool with a drill and you get a little crazy, sure enough, boom, volcano. I've probably had this happen to me more times than I should have because you just get a little careless and it, it can still happen. So watch out for that. And on the, the topic of making a massive mess, once you first start making wine from grapes, like real whole grapes, which I recommend for anybody that wants to make high quality red wine, what happens is you, maybe you're fermenting in a bucket, maybe you're fermenting in a barrel, usually some sort of open top container. And you might have a little bit of room on top of the wine and you think you're pretty good. Well, once that wine starts fermenting, all those skins will fill up with um, CO2 and just expand. And you come down the next morning and you've just got a massive, <laughs> massive mess. This can happen with fresh fruits too. So if you're working with like blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, anything where you kind of break them up to get the fermentation started and then you, you get it going, it can just swell up. You really wanna be a little bit generous on how much air space you're leaving during fermentation. And during fermentation, air is usually a good thing. So you're not really worried about oxidation. The yeast is very air hungry. You actually have a lot more problems when you air starve a fermentation than when you, you know, give too much fermentation or too much air to a fermentation. And now back to things that could happen when you first start making wine with grapes. When you go to press, what you'll do is you'll scoop this um, fermented wine out of whatever your fermenter is pour it into your press, which is often a basket press. It's got the wood slats and you can get, you know, pretty, uh, pretty boisterous when you're pouring that in. Sometimes you're drinking a little bit of wine and what happens once in a while is you pour a little too much in, it starts kind of shooting out of the spout and overshoots your, you know, your bucket or your funnel or whatever you're pressing into. And you could lose a couple bottles of wine like that and it's always such a shame especially when you're working with really you know expensive grapes so just pour into that press kind of careful even once you start cranking the press take it easy especially once you you know are just getting it started is when it can really flow like crazy and also make sure you always have a second container ready to go to swap out because you can fill that bucket or fill that carboy and and then you're you're kind of scrambling now this is a disaster i've heard way too many times and it has to do with adding things like um, sulfite or tartaric acid or potassium bicarbonate and one of a couple things can happen you can grab the wrong powder all these things kind of look pretty similar so maybe you're thinking oh, i need to add 10 grams of um, tartaric acid to adjust my acid and you accidentally add 10 grams of potassium metabisulfite and you have bleached the wine you've made it this sterile unfermentable just you know smells like burnt matches kind of environment which is you really can't come back from it you might be able to you know add something that will counteract the sulfite like um, hydrogen peroxide but you've really damaged the chemical structure of that wine so you've really you know caused a lot of harm i see this with a lot of people that make wine kits too where it says you know, add this before the fermentation, add this after the fermentation. Well, sometimes they add that little packet of potassium sorbate accidentally before fermentation. And what potassium sorbate does is it basically prevents yeast from um, replicating or from budding and making more yeast cells. So you really can't establish a colony of yeast to ferment and all you have is this stinky, um, off-smelling, struggling, fermentation. So be very, very careful when you're adding this stuff. Make sure you don't mix up milligrams with grams. You don't want to accidentally add like a hundred times more or add the absolute wrong thing, like add um, bicarbonate when you're trying to add tartaric acid and completely move the wine in the opposite direction. Again, a pretty easy mistake to make because you just got so much going on and you start to get confident and then you get complacent and that kind of stuff can happen. This can happen to, um, a lot of people will say when you're aging wine to use a solid stopper or a solid bung instead of an airlock. And that seems to be the talk of a lot of these, you know, wine um, communities. 
And there is actually truth to that because when you have an airlock, especially a plastic airlock, air can dissolve in the water, which works its way to the wine. Um, if the wine expands and contracts, a bubble can go backwards, send some air into the wine, and the plastic is actually not completely impermeable to air. So you are letting some oxygen into the wine, but if you're um, sulfite and if you've got a wine like a red wine with a lot of tannin, it can handle a little bit of air. Consider it basically micro oxidation, which can help that wine age, um, but you just kind of got to stay on top of it. But what can happen when you're, you try to do the right thing and you put a solid um, bung in with no hole, whether it's cork or it's um, rubber is, and I've seen this, I've done this, and it's actually steered me away from solid bungs, is even just the little bit of expansion and contraction from the temperature changing will fire that bung off, off the ceiling. It'll be, you won't even be able to find it. It could be like all the way across the room. And it might not happen right away. It might happen a week after you put it on when you're just not really even checking on things. And now this wine that you're trying not to oxidize has totally oxidized. So to be safe, I generally just do airlocks. You can use glass airlocks, which are much you know, more air impermeable. And also the, um, like the, the rubber stoppers that actually kind of smell like vulcanized rubber. That smell's not gonna get into your wine. Those are much more air um, tight than like a silicone stopper, which is going to be air pretty, pretty air permeable, actually. This is another thing I've seen in the comments section where people are like, oh, awesome. I found some grapes. Let's go make some wine. So they see grapes. They pick grapes. They go to make wine. Well, maybe they pick those grapes in like July and those grapes are they're not even really starting to ripen yet, let alone being optimally ripe. And optimal ripeness is really what makes good wine. You really need that optimal ripeness. And they're like, well, how can I make wine from these? Well, you really, you really can't. Like you can add a bunch of sugar to it. You can add a bunch of um, potassium bicarbonate to try to take the edge off this acid, but you, you, really, you don't want to just go pick a fruit because you see a fruit. You want to wait and let that fruit ripen. That's when it's going to build the flavors that you want. That's when it's going to get rid of some of the flavors that you don't want. It's going to build the sugars, the acid, acids. It's going to really be not really right to be making wine from wildly um, underripe fruit, no matter what fruit it is. This happened to me. Um, I don't, I won't say this is common, but I was making wine with a friend. We were, um, cranking the, the crusher destemmer. One of us would be taking the bin out to dump it in our big fermenter, put it back in, pour some grapes in, crank some more. Well, um, we get to talking and I, I hear I'm down there pouring the, the grapes into the fermenter and I hear the crusher destemmer cranking and I'm thinking, what, like I have the bin what's that cranking? And I come up and she's just cranking the crusher de stemmer and all these grapes and, and juice is just falling onto the ground. And, you know, these grapes can be easily, you can spend $3 a pound on premium grapes. So a couple minutes of cranking, you could blow through $50 like nothing. So just um, maybe pay attention to what you're doing. If you're having some wine while you're doing your winemaking, maybe pay attention even a little bit more. Now, a lot of people get into winemaking and they want to jump to a barrel, like a 30 gallon barrel, a 10 gallon barrel, or the ultimate, like a 66 gallon full size barrel. But a word of caution when scaling up to a, a wine barrel, especially if you're coming from things like carboys, is they are pretty um, air permeable. And at the bigger sizes, it becomes less of a problem. But at the small sizes, like a 10 gallon barrel, you really got to be careful because that wine will oxidize pretty easily. You need things that are going to help you not oxidize are going to be good, good acid. So relatively low pH, great tannin. Um, and you really got to keep your eye on the, the free sulfur dioxide. So the sulfite, cause it'll just, um, react with that oxygen. It'll completely go away. And to be honest, if you have a wine with like a, a pH of like 3.5, seven or higher and it's not just insanely high in tannin 
it's gonna be dangerous to um, to age that in a barrel unless you're pretty pretty experienced. So be careful when scaling up to a barrel because you could have a wine that basically smells like nail polish remover or vinegar, which are the couple of the big big ways a wine can oxidize and kind of not be something you want you know 150 or 300 bottles of. This isn't maybe a huge disaster, but a lot of people will cork their wines and just put it right on the shelf. But what I like to do when I cork my wines, I like to leave them sit upright for about a week. Um, Cause sometimes you squeeze that cork and it doesn't really swell back out and create a nice perfect seal. And if you put it right on the shelf right away, the wine will kind of work its way up the cork and it can even kind of weep out of the end. So um, just a word of advice, usually cork it, leave the corks, leave the bottles upright and you shouldn't really have that problem. This is maybe my last disaster that comes to mind. Um, as you scale up as a winemaker, you get in, maybe you start with one gallon, you get to six gallons, and then maybe at some point you're making 30 or 50 gallons of wine with some buddies. Um, you need to keep in mind that yeast um, will create a lot of heat actually. And the bigger the volume, the more this heat can start to kind of build up and run away on you. So it's not uncommon to start a red wine fermentation and put some heaters on it, whether it's space heaters or seed heaters, even a heated blanket, just to warm the temperature up to get into that kind of 80, 85 degrees Fahrenheit that can really help extract nicely. But, you know, once that fermentation takes off, maybe you go to bed, um, you come check on it in the next morning, that fermentation can start roaring on you. And um, it would not be uncommon to see it take it all the way to 100 degrees Fahrenheit where um, you're starting to kind of cook the wine and you're also starting to create a, a hostile environment for the yeast. So then you'll see things like hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell, other things you just don't want to have in your wine. So kind of ease up on the temperature and don't like leave the wine for 12 hours without watching it while having something like a seed heater on it and have things ready to go. Like you could put a, a um, frozen milk jugs and things to, to cool it down if things kinda, kinda do run away on you. Good luck in your wines this year. I hope you don't have any disasters like this, but if you do, I'd love to hear about them. Thanks for watching.